All right, it's my great pleasure to welcome Elvira Mariodomo all the way from Saragossa, uh, who will tell us about the uh, finite state dimension and its point to set principle. Thank you very much, Stefan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I hope, uh, I wish it was uh, in person, but uh, we have to, to take advantage of these uh, um, Zoom meetings uh, and to to be able to both uh, speak and listen to, to interesting talks. So, so thank you very much. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is a finite state dimension, which is a kind of effective dimension, which works um, differently from more uh, um, a higher uh, resource bound uh, dimension uh, concepts, such as effective dimension, Schnorr dimension, etc. And I like to, to kind of show you the differences and maybe uh, uh, try to, to get a bit of intuition of what these differences can mean for us. Okay, so the usual uh, motivation, which I will repeat because I'm not sure exactly who is there in the room or maybe attending. Uh, the, the people, the four people I see right now, plus Manlio, probably don't need this, but the thing is that uh, we uh, effectivize the notion in order to make it uh, useful in our world, in the computability world. And then uh, we effectivize it even more in order to use it uh, in the uh, most restricted automata, uh, finite automata work. And then we, 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 can, uh, we can use this effectivization back in the classical uh, uh, geometrical measure work. So this is more or less the motivation. Let me start just reminding you uh, how we usually do effectivization. Uh, one of the most uh, common uh, ways is by using gambling, okay? So everybody probably knows that the martingale assigns each uh, finite uh, string, each finite sequence, uh, a real value, and the uh, balancing uh, condition is that the value of uh, in a sequence sigma is exactly the average of the value over sigma zero and sigma one. Okay, so everything here are strings over the alphabet zero one. And uh, we say that the martingale succeeds when the value that you obtain uh, goes to infinity. Uh, in the in the case of uh, effective dimension, we want this success to be even better. Okay, so uh, given an infinite sequence x, and given a, a, I'm sorry, there is a lot of noise here. I hope you are not hearing it. Okay, <laughs> some army planes have decided that this is the right time for flying. They promise they never fly after ten, but as you can say. See, it is 11 and they're still playing. <laughs> Apologies. Okay, let me get back to this. So the idea is that uh, uh, Martingale D succeeds on an infinite sequence. S succeeds, meaning that uh, it goes to infinity and it goes to infinity faster than two to the one minus S times the length, okay? So uh, this idea of S uh, success is what allows us to characterize uh, House of dimension in terms of uh, gambling. Okay, so a martingale D S succeeds on a, on a set if it succeeds on every point in the sex set. And we can define the house of dimension, we can characterize please, the house of dimension of a set of sequences just by taking the infimum of all, all S for which there is a martingale that S succeeds on A, okay? So this is completely 
uh, classical, no effectivization, no computability required. But this characterization very naturally is calling for, uh, for, effective, for an effective version. And if we ask these gambling uh, devices, these martingales, to be computable in a certain setting, it will give us a generalization of this notion that probably will, will give us uh, larger values than classical hazard dimension, that it, but it will be more useful in more restrictive settings. So for instance, today, I want to look at finite state effectivization. So what we're going to do is we are going to restrict to martingales that can be computed by a finite state automata. Okay, and uh, since we are uh, going down um, in the research bound uh, level, uh, we don't have uh, many of the, um, the properties that you get from uh, linear time and on. For instance, if you try to look at uh, the Euclidean space, that is real numbers, you have to be very careful with coding. And the alphabet that you use in this coding, that is the base in which you represent real numbers, is very meaningful, okay? So for instance, this is a drawing of a finite state gambler. It has two states, A and B. And the alphabet uh, that I am using is zero and one. So that is why all the arrows that move from one state to the other are labeled by either zero or one, representing the input, um, the input alphabet. And the rational numbers that are between in A and B, they correspond to how much this gambler is betting on whether the next bit is zero. Okay. So the, the fraction two thirds, for instance, if you are in a state A. Uh, you bet two thirds that your next uh, symbol is going to be a zero. Mm -hmm. And correspondingly, one third to your next symbol being one. So the betting depends only on the state you're in. Okay, So the number of different possibilities coincides with the number of states. So in this simple example, you're, all, you're only going to have two different choices. Okay, so restricting the definition, which I haven't included, means that I'm going to take here the finite state dimension, which may be defined later actually, is the infimum overall uh, gamblers or martingales that can be computed by a finite state machine. Oh, it's here, okay, sorry. So the finite state dimension uh, of a set is the the smallest S for which there is a finite state uh, martingale, which I think I forgot to include there, that S succeeds on it. Okay, so this was a definition that was proposed in uh, 2004, but actually finite state gamblers have been uh, largely studied before for different purposes. And there is a very interesting property which is a strong dichotomy theorem by Schnorr and Stim from 1972, in which they show that actually for an infinite sequence, the behavior of the martingale can only be very extreme. It can be going very quickly to infinity or going very quickly to, to zero, okay? So for each computable martingale D and for each uh, infinite sequence X, either, there is an S for which D, S succeeds on X, or the values of D are basically constant, or else uh, they go very quickly to zero. The uh, D of X, of the, of X uh, up to N is uh, smaller than alpha to the N for alpha less than one. So this, uh, this uh, di extreme dichotomy is very useful in order to deal with these finite state gamblers because the, the possible behaviors are very limited. And this, this has been used, I will tell you where later on. There is a second uh, possibility for defining a finite state, for characterizing actually finite state dimension, 
that is uh, information lossless finite state compressors. Okay, they're just transducers, they're just finite state machines with output, and uh, they are required to be information lossless, meaning that uh, you can recover your input from both from the output and the last state that you visit. Okay, but you need both. Okay, so given the last state and the output, you you can you can recover the input exactly. So there's absolutely no information loss. And this is uh, an example. This one has four states that are lab labeled zero, one, two, three, and you can see each of the transitions has a, a symbol that is the input, then the slash and the output. And for instance, lambda is the empty, the empty uh, string. Okay. And well, in this example, you can easily see that the, the input can always be recovered from the output and the last state. And so you can see that there are certain transitions that seem to be saving a lot of information. There's a lot of lambdas, but somehow it is always possible to recover uh, the whole input. See somehow the, this, uh, all these lambdas in this cycle, zero, one, two, three, they kind of uh, are counter uh, balanced by, by the last transition or something like that. Okay. And what happens with this information lossless finite state compressors uh, is that uh, they were very, very uh, studied before the 70s. They were actually used in practice to compress information. But then in 1978, Lampel and C design an algorithm that was sort of universal for all of them. Not strictly universal, it was be better, best, it was better than all finite state compressors. And this was a very interesting property. So the, um, the compression ratio of a, of a transducer M is just the limit of the, the length of the output over the length of the input. It's not very important whether you include the state there or not, because there's only finitely many states. And uh, what Lempelsheep did, did was uh, an algorithm that uh, it's, it's time uh, nearly linear. It's a bit more than linear. It's a uh, logarithm to, to some constant. But uh, you know, in practical terms, uh, linear time does not really exist. So this is this is as close as linear time as you can get. And this uh, the compression ratio of this Lambert algorithm is uh, better than any uh, finite state test user. Okay. So in many ways, this Lambert algorithm is used in practice as a universal. Uh, version of these uh, information lossless finite state compressors. Even if there are sec sequences that Lempelsheet compresses a bit more than, than the best uh, finite state compression. And the interest for us for this finite state dimension is that you can characterize uh, finite state uh, dimension also with these uh, compressors. Okay, so the finite state dimension of a single sequence. Is just the best uh, compressor, uh, the, the, the compression ratio the, for the best compressor. And if you take a set, you have to take uh, the infimum as the last quantifier. Okay, so you have to first for each m, you take uh, the 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 point for which uh, m compresses less, and then you take the infimum overall. M. So uh, this is um, kind of the, the natural way that you, you start with a gambling a characterization. You're able to get a, a compression characterization. But you know, from the, the kind of uh, effectivizations of dimensions that we are more used to, this is not exactly uh, the, say, the way we were doing it. Uh, you're probably familiar with uh, more uh, Kolmogorov complexity like characterization. That is, instead of looking at the, uh, the compressor, you look at the decompressor. 
Okay, so comorbid complexity is kind of defined as a decompression idea. So uh, can we do it uh, with Kolmogorov complexity uh, style? So uh, the idea is that uh, if you, you take a single finite state transducer, but you can just define a sort of uh, information complexity like that. So it is the length of the shortest uh, string that outputs uh, what you're interested in, the sigma, the, uh, the target uh, sequence. So uh, it's been proven first by Doty and Moser, and it was recently uh, revisited in automatic complexity papers by uh, uh, Kosachinsky and Sen, that you can also characterize a finite state dimension using this uh, decompression, this this uh, Kolmogorov-like style, but of course you you always have to uh, have this extra quantifier corresponding to the fact that you don't have a universal automata. So you always have to take the infimum overall automata of the compression ratio in a Kolmogorov complexity uh, sets. I. I have, I have the impression I'm not using the last version of my slides, but let's forget about it. Doesn't really matter. There are more characterizations of uh, uh, finite state dimension. In fact, pretty interesting ones. For instance, there is one by Hitchcock that is in terms of uh, finite state predictors, that is uh, learning algorithms, and the log loss, that is the, the error that these algorithms uh, are allowed on an infinite uh, sequence. Then there is a, there are also characterizations in terms of block entropy. That is, you count the, um, the number of different blocks of a certain length. Okay, you use this frequency as a probability and you take the entropy of this probability. And this gives you back a finite state dimension, no matter whether you use uh, overlapping or non-overlapping blocks. Okay, so for uh, for non-overlapping, that was the first uh, proof in 2005, and recently it's also been proven for overlapping uh, block entropy. Uh, also, there's been a recent uh, paper on the Weil criterion. The Weil criterion is a way to characterize normality, which I will. Uh, uh, Mention later. And uh, this uh, characterization of normality has been extended to finite state dimension, to any value of finite state dimension. I was doubting whether to include this full char this characterization, but it's, it's not a simple one. I, I, I think it gives you an interesting intuition on how to use uh, Fourier analysis, but it it is uh, it's not a simple, I mean, there are certain cases for which uh, the finite state dimension, uh, I mean, for certain sets of sequences, this characterization, I think is very interesting, but in general, you need to, uh, you need to go through, through too many um, Fourier uh, coefficients in order to get to the, to the to the value of the finite state dimension. That is, that there are like several cases. The in in a, in a in a case in which you can get the finite state dimension from a single sequence, the characterization is very natural and very interesting. Okay, so finite state dimension uh, was studied uh, much later than Borel normality. But it's true that uh, it, I think it has uh, contributed to the, to the full, uh, to, the, to, to grasping exactly what Borel normality uh, means for us. Um, so let me see. This is the notation that you usually use for representing real numbers in a certain base. Okay, so you have um, a finite alphabet that corresponds to the digit that you can use in your representation. And I am going to use uh, 
sig b of x, that is the, the sequence, the infinite, potentially infinite sequence that represents the real number x in base b. And then you can also go backwards. You can start with a representation with a finite or infinite uh, 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 sequence in the alphabet 0 to b minus 1. And you can look at the real number that is represented by those digits. Uh, in general, we are always looking at uh, real numbers between 0 and 1. And we just take the, the fractional part. This is the usual idea. So uh, in 2005, it was finally proven that a real number is normal in a certain base B, if and only if the corresponding uh, sequence representing uh, the number in base B has finite a state dimension one. Okay. So uh, since it's, uh, it was known uh, for quite a while, I think it was uh, Castle that proved that there are numbers that are normal in a certain base and not in another. They are normal, for instance, in base two and not in base three. This is very, this makes uh, very clear that the uh, finite state dimension cannot be defined for real numbers in a more robust way that it does not depend on the alphabet. The alphabet is very, very relevant. Okay, so there is the, a stronger concept of absolutely normal and absolutely normal numbers, they are normal in every base. Okay, and uh, it's uh, absolutely normal numbers which happen to be very useful for um, cryptography, I think. They, I think they are called up, up, up your sleeve uh, randomness. Okay, they, they have been uh, built uh, from, uh, uh, from, the, from Turing at the beginning of the 20th century. Then Schmidt also had a very interesting construction. And more recently, Several people have looked at this uh, idea of uh, at this problem of constructing uh, absolutely normal numbers from different perspectives. So, for instance, Veronica Becher, she has tried to construct uh, absolutely normal numbers that converge very quickly. Okay? And uh, we have uh, also uh, constructed a, an absolutely normal number, trying to make this the, the fastest possible. In, it, and this fastest was uh, near linear, linear time. So this was for, for, for a while. This, this kind of uh, concepts were one of the main motivations to study finite state dimension, meaning that finite state dimension was very connected to number theory in that sense, to concepts related to Borel normality, to concepts related to uh, to the idea of sequences, to, to block entropy, okay? But uh, if you go back to other definitions of uh, effective dimension, we are more used of looking at uh, points in Euclidean space, for instance, in sort of a more geometrical way. So, for instance, if we go to uh, point to set principle, uh, the point to set principle is based on defining a Kolmogorov complexity of a real point at a certain precision delta. Okay, so uh, the Kolmogorov complexity of X at precision delta is just the smallest description of a rational number that is at distance at most delta, okay? I, I use, again, real here, okay? So sigma is just uh, the, uh, a string describing the rational number in the usual, um, so uh, describing a dyadic, for instance, number if, if the alphabet is true, et cetera. And once you have this uh, complexity of X precision delta, this allows you to have a more kind of a geometric definition of effective dimension. Geometric in the sense that I am moving a bit away from a from a Cantor space, and like 
now my idea of uh, of information content is more related to to balls in the space so uh this is the the result that, that is the point to set principle i think everybody here has heard about this before but in case you haven't the idea is that given a uh, a set in the Euclidean uh, space here to make it easier. This is a set in in a, a subset of the interval zero one. The house of dimension, the classical house of dimension, is the effective dimension of this set uh, relativized to an oracle, and you take the uh, the oracle that gives you the smallest value. Okay, so this is the minimum over all possible oracles of the effective dimension of E relative to A. Okay, so this, this result uh, has proven so far pretty um, fruitful for um, geometric, uh, uh, sorry, for geometric measure theory results. And uh, we wanted to, to see how how far all this is from uh, the effectivization that we uh, that we were using for uh, norm for concepts such as normality for finite state dimension? So what can we do? Sorry, this is really I can I uh, make you wait for a second and change the version. Oh, because uh, I this is not just the version of slides I wanted to use, <laughs> and I was like saying, okay, I'll doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. I want to, I like to show things uh, little by little, <laughs> and this time I have absolutely okay. I'll just move to the same slide. Sorry for uh, to have you waiting. Okay. I'll just move this. Am I sharing the same or? It's the same still, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. I, sorry for that. Uh, one second. Okay. I think this is a bit better. And this way I can see the clock, which I didn't have either. <laughs> and it was like a bit <laughs> lost. <laughs> Apologies. Okay. So this, uh, as I was telling you, uh, so we have this nice idea of, uh, of uh, finite state dimension. We use it in, in the setting of uh, number theory. And then we have a different effectivization that happens to have this nice point to set pr uh, principle. So are these that different? What else can we do? And the thing is that uh, uh, we can uh, we can get a geometrical kind of finite state dimension. Geometrical in what sense? Well, at least I want to be able to to look at neighbor at the neighborhood of a point and kind of use that uh, in my definition of uh, finite state dimension. So what you can, what I can do is uh, start try to start with the definition of um, inform, uh, information content uh, from a, a transducer T of a certain point X, uh, Euclidean point at precision delta. Okay, so it's just take the shortest uh, description of a real number that is in the in the delta ball uh, of X. And once you have this, well, you say, oh, this this looks a bit more than a bit more to the previous uh, definition of effective dimension. So why don't you just use this for finite state dimension? Okay, so you could you could look at uh, finite state uh, state dimension of a certain point x, okay, x in Euclidean space, and then yeah, the b is necessary because I am looking at a uh, uh, transducers that have input alphabet uh, sigma b. Okay, uh, it's not clear if you if you if you make the alphabet also a variable, uh, then it's going to be uh, it's going to be pretty different from uh, from this idea of finite state dimension that was so heavily based on uh, sequences written on, on a certain alphabet. Okay, 
So this could be uh, still restricting yourself to transducers over the same alphabet, but instead of looking at just a single sequence that represents X, just look at the uh, information content of X at precision delta. Okay, and uh, how different are these uh, concepts from finding the state dimension? Well, fortunately, they coincide in the sense that if you have a real number X, you look at the sequence that uh, corresponds to the real number X uh, on base B. The finite state dimension of this sequence is exactly the finite state dimension of real number X uh, uh, in representation B, and the same for um, for sets. Okay, so yeah, you can have a, a finite state dimension uh, characterization that is slightly uh, closer to our idea of how the um, how the magic in the Euclidean space should work. Once you have this. You again try to see, okay, but can you do the point to set principle here in this space? And uh, well, in order to do the point to set principle, uh, we need to relativize because so what the, the point to set principle says is, okay, uh, classical dimension coincides to with effective dimension. If you relativize, okay, yes, take the best oracle. Relativize and take the, take the vector oracle. So, what what do you relativize here? Well, if you look at this uh, definition of a, of a Kolmogorov complexity at a certain precision, uh, if you know uh, T is a finite state transducer, how do you relativize the finite state transducer? That is that is not an easy thing to do. Of course, you you can you can find kind of a bit artificial ways of you know, having an extra tape, maybe like having a, having a double input, but that's, uh, I mean, if you consider that your automata is going to read uh, your input only once, uh, that doesn't give you a lot of uh, room there, a lot of freedom. So uh, what you can get uh, also change in this uh, definition is the way you rep represent the real numbers, okay? So because here, what you have is for each uh, finite, uh, finite sigma, you look at the rational number represented exactly by this sigma in a very standard way of just taking this sigma as the fractional part of the, of the real number. But this is only one possibility. What about if this uh, enumeration of the rational numbers that uh, are, um, that are dense in the Euclidean space could be different. That, that would be an alternative way of kind of relativizing, changing this uh, enumeration of the rational numbers or some other dense subset of the Euclidean space. So this is what you can do in order to make this uh, finite state definition a bit less uh, um, rigid in terms of uh, relativization. So what you can do is uh, change this, uh, uh, this uh, real number represented by, by sigma by a different enumeration. What do I mean? Well, just let's take any uh, function f from uh, from sigma star, actually, sorry, this to do sigma star to uh, zero one. So that uh, the image of this function, so it, this function goes from finite strings to, to reals, so that the image is dense, okay, is dense in the Euclidean space. And now what you, ca what you can do is you can define Kolmogorov complexity at precision delta, but with this enumeration of, sorry. With this, with this enumeration of the rationals or the dense set that you need. And you still get a meaningful definition, meaning that you're going to, to look at the shorter description of a sigma so that 
this f maps sigma to a very to a very close uh, number to x so once you have this it makes perfect sense to have a finite state dimension relative to enumeration f okay so the relativization is completely in the enumeration of the of the dense set and the rest is uh, is just the same as before so you take the best uh, finite state transducer and for this uh, finite state uh, finite state transducer you're looking at the compression ratio okay of the uh, delta approx uh, approximated uh, information content over the, the corresponding logarithm of one over delta um, in this case uh, the alphabet uh, is is meaningful because we're going to use a transducer with alphabet sigma and uh, in this sense the enumerator starts with the finite strings over this alphabet sigma okay so uh, once you have this kind of relativization again you get you get a point to set principle. How does it look? Well, the idea is that uh, for each different enumeration f, you get a different concept, a different relativization of this state dimension. And again, the classical half so dimension of a set E is going to be the relativization, the finite state uh, dimension relativized. To the best f okay so you again you take the minimum over all numerators of uh sorry i in all these uh enumerators i have forgotten the uh sigma 2 is the alphabet but i'm looking at finite finite strings over sigma 2 and in this uh, in this uh, theorem it doesn't really matter whether you use a single alphabet or you can use them all, you can choose the alphabet, okay? Because once you are allowed to, to move, to relativize over different F, uh, a single alphabet is enough, okay? So what does this theorem mean? Well, it means that if, you, if we are able to find a, uh, methods to, to control finite state dimension, they can be translated to a control of the house of the classical house of dimension. What do I mean with control? Okay, the finite state dimension is always going to be an upper bound of the house of dimension. But it, what is more interesting is how to get a lower bound. Okay, so uh, in principle, a lower bound, bound on finite state dimension should be should be in principle at least conceptual, conceptually easier because you are, we are only trying to bound the the behavior of a finite state automata okay so this was the main thing i wanted to tell you about today um so uh there's there's also a few uh consequences of of this uh, of this uh, theorem, one is uh, we were trying to look at the, how this point to set principle uh, really is using the oracles, okay? And what you can see here from all these definitions of Kolmogorov uh, complexity is really the oracle is just like a final query, in fact of a single functional query that gives you a, that gives you a single real. Okay. Uh, it's also clear that it could be interesting in different levels of uh, effectivization of dimension to separate compression and relativization. Okay. At the moment, you know, if you look at the uh, definition of uh, effective dimension, everything is together and seems to work, but it's but since it's clear that you can uh, consider these two effects separately, this, this could be interesting in order to get better um, lower bounds. Also, I wanted to stop a minute 
uh, in the concept of optimal oracles that uh, was studied by uh, Don Stuhl last year. A house of optimal okay. oracle is uh, the oracle that you need for the point to set principle, uh, but uh, the fact that it's optimal means that um, if you add an extra oracle to it, so for every, so A is an optimal oracle for a set E, if of course it gives you back uh, the uh, house of dimension of E, okay? So it's like the DA, one of the A's that is the, the result of the point to set principle, but also if you add an extra B, it doesn't give you back more in the sense that uh, if you add uh, Oracle B and Epsilon, uh, and if you have an Epsilon, there is a point on which uh, actually Oracle B doesn't help, okay? It doesn't give you a, a effective dimension better than the dimension of E. Also, this, uh, this uh, in, uh, in the definition of uh, optimal oracles, after optimal oracles, this is also required in, at the level of uh, Kolmogorov complexity. Okay, so this is the original definition. And what does this definition give you? Well, what it gives you is that sets with optimal oracles uh, are um, very well uh, behaving in terms of uh, uh, classical halves of dimension. And for instance, uh, they include uh, previous cases such as analytic sets, this is the first one, or sets that have uh, the same house of unpacking dimension, that's what uh, is usually called regular sets. They, uh, uh, both of these have optimal oracles. And uh, different results on the, on the, on the, a strong properties of a uh, house of them or no I, I mean in fact the, this definition of a uh, house of optimal work uh, was uh, was devised precisely for the um, for the projection theorems okay so in order to have uh, the mm, an interesting connection of the of the dimension of a set and the dimension of most of its projections this couldn't be proven for any set. It was known for analytic sets. It was known for sets that are regular in the sense of packing and has a dimension coinciding. And Don, Don Stuhl uh, invented, the, uh, invented this definition of uh, optimal oracles. And these sets that have these optimal oracles have the same desirable behavior that both analytic sets or regular sets have in, in classical theorems. So um, this idea of optimal oracles, what, uh, what I think um, could be extended is to uh, optimal uh, effectivization, uh, sorry, optimal enumeration functions, okay? If you change uh, relativization, of effective dimension from oracles to uh, enumerations. Let, let's let's see what means for enumeration to be optimal in that sense. So, what um, what can we do with the kind of a, with this finite state point to set principle? I think we should be able to find better lower bounds on the finite state dimension. That should probably translate to classical uh, house of dimension because of the point to set principle. I am very interested in looking at the gambling characterizations of this uh, finite state uh, extension to enumerators. So it's not uh, very clear once you get out of the comfort zone of the of the easy uh, representation of reals by infinite sequence how things go. But I think it will be very interesting. Also, in the same sense, uh, block entropy is very related to the representation of real numbers by, by infinite sequences in the usual way. So what happens if you are enumerating 
uh, then set of the Euclidean space, or even the rationals. If you fix, uh, uh, I am only going to enumerate uh, dyadic numbers. Can you can you do something that looks remotely like a, a block entropy? Uh, also, it is interesting to to look at the gauge dimension. Um, before looking at this uh, relativization of finite state dimension, it wasn't very clear if you could do finite state dimension that was uh, that was not uh, yes using the the the, the usual uh, gauge function. What do I mean? Well, what we usually sorry. Okay, um, where is V? Ah, okay, yeah, sorry. So this is uh, uh, the gauge uh, dimension. Instead of co comparing um, cosmograph complexity, the cosmograph complexity ratio directly to S, you have a different function that relates uh, delta and S, okay? So this allows you to uh, distinguish uh, dimension in, for instance, uh, spaces that have uh, has a dimension infinity or in other uh, subsets of uh, of, a, of Euclidean space, etc., where you want to be uh, more specific in the quantification of the dimension. But uh, using finite state dimension. Since you have this uh, dichotomy, this is Schnorr steam theorem, looks like uh, looking out of linear is not possible somehow, like the, the complexity is going to be always linear in the in the size of the of the string you're trying to describe. But if you just uh, use um Colmore complexity at a certain uh, precision, you, you can just uh, use uh, any uh, suitable uh, gauge family. And you can uh, study finite state dimension even with a different scale than the usual uh, diameter to the S. Okay, so this is uh, a few things I like to see. Um, I wrote a few of the references. I mentioned not all of them. In particular, I didn't uh, write the the first references on um, finite state gamblers on normality because there are many of them. And, but I wanted to write enough so that if you were interested in reading about it, so like a starting place. So mostly references on the point to set principle, and also I included the. Uh, a good reference for finding the state image. And I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention and for your patience. I'm afraid I fell a little bit, the, the time difference. I thought I was a bit more, I don't know, I am awake, but I am. I, I don't feel completely, <laughs> I don't feel too too intelligent at this time of the, of the evening. So thank you very much for your attention and please uh, contact me if you want to know a bit more about this. Thanks a lot, Elvira. Are there any questions thank you, uh, from uh, online or in? All right, uh, don't see any. Yep, I'll see you. Thank you from Joe. Okay, thank you very much again, Elvira. Thank you. Hello, Vera. Thanks for staying up so late. To <laughs> thank you, Mary.